going to be talking about web sites, website design principles to DIY like a pro. Um, she's been designing WordPress, but she's been designing websites for 20 years. She's had an agency for 13, blogging for 10, organizes the Sacramento WordPress meetup, and she is also an organizer for WordCamp in Sacramento. Welcome, Jennifer Bourne. Yeah. about typography, about contrast, about color, about alignment, about where things go, about what size things need to be. And then when I'm out and we're talking to people, uh, one of our most popular nights for our local meetup in Sacramento is the Help Night. We do a version of the happiness bar that you see at WordCamps. We do that at our meetup. Uh, every fourth meetup is a Help Night where all anybody can bring out their computers and they can say, I need help with my WordPress site. <coughs> And one of the things we hear a lot is, I've been working so hard on my design, but it still doesn't quite look right. Or they say, how come my site doesn't look as good as their site? As their site, right? And, and you know, you want to look at your site and think, this is amazing! You know, be super proud and go out and be able to tell the whole world about it because you're so excited about it. Um, but oftentimes it's little things that you can tweak and little changes that you can make that are based on basic design principles, right? That are going to make a big difference in the success of your site, not only in how it looks, in the design and the appearance, but in how people experience your content and move through your site. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. First thing, typography. Because even more important than the design is the type. Because if your type sucks, nobody is going to be able to read your content, or they're not going to want to read your content, and they're going to move on. And the key to having more conversions on your site isn't a beautiful design, but it's the content, it's the words, it's the call to action. It's what you're saying on the site that they're going to get people to take action. So we're talking about typography. And the very first principle that we're talking about is just sticking to the basics. The very first thing we're talking about is sticking to the basics, right? So with Google Fonts, with Typekit, with being able to enqueue uh, fonts from several different options, you have all kinds of choices. You have all kinds of bad choices, right? Script fonts, display fonts, fonts that look super cool, while they look super cool, don't make for a great reading experience in a lot of cases. So when we're looking at content on your site, and we're seeing this with big brands around the world, there's 
over time, we're seeing right now a lot of big brands simplifying their logos down and simplifying all their content down, and they're going from these display-type fonts and scripts and things that are all unique and have personality down to sans-serif fonts, to plain style fonts that are, e because they're easy to read, they're simple, and they render well on all devices and at all sizes. So these are just some of the basics. These aren't the fonts I'm telling you or the typefaces I'm telling you to stick with. But you want to stick with the basics. A sans-serif font has no little feet. It's the one like Proxima Nova here or Franklin Gothic or a serif that has the feet that's more a traditional book style. Either one of those two for readability, making it easy to read and legibility, making it easy over time to consume that content, uh, these are going to be your best choices. Now, I'm not saying you can't use something that's unique, but you're going to use something, if you're going to bring in a script font or a display font or something fun and funky, use it as an accent and not a primary headline or a primary type of content. When you're looking at using different typefaces, now, does everybody in here know what the difference is between a typeface and a font? Some people know, some people don't. A font is the file that you use, right? The font is just the, is the electronic file for a typeface. So the typeface is the design or the style, and the font is just the electronic file. So people use them interchangeably. I may in this talk as well. But when you're looking at typefaces, if you're not quite sure what to do or you're not sure of a, of a good pairing of two different fonts to use together, the easiest way to look like a pro is to pick one typeface but use two different weights. And my favorite is to pick a typeface that has a lot in the family. So this is, I use Museo on my personal site on jenniferborn.com, uh, Museo Sans, and I love that typeface because it has a whole bunch of options. So it has light, regular, semi-bold, bold, black. So I go with light and bold. So I skip regular and I skip semi-bold. By using 100 and 700, I have a really high level of contrast between my body copy and my bold, or my body copy and my headlines. So one typeface family, but two different weights that have high contrast, is a really simple way to look like a pro. If you're gonna use two different fonts, two different typefaces, then you wanna use two different styles, right? Look for contrast between the two. So use a serif and a sans serif. Right? You don't want to use two of the same style. Two of the same style to a general visitor who's coming to your site, it looks like you messed up. It says, uh-oh, somebody picked the wrong one right there. Somebody accidentally messed up. It's the same thing with colors. It's the same thing with most design elements. You want to go for a contrast, go for a big difference, because if things are too similar, they look like they should have been the same, and somebody made a mistake. So you want to go for the biggest amount of contrast that you can, the differences between the two. When looking at type sizes, this is another one where we run into um, a lot of issues with people having uh, readability issues on their site or their site just not quite looking the way that they want is size. When I first started building websites, the body copy was 12 point. And then it was 14. And then it was 16. And for years, we built, we built websites with 16-point body copy, 14-point sidebar type, 12-point footer type, right? And then it was 18. Last, like we moved a couple years ago to starting to build them with 18. My, my site, Jennifer Born, that, uh, my new site that I launched last year, it's 20. My body copy is 20. That's crazy pants. But that's like, as a designer, I'm like, that's insane. But it's easy to read. It makes the content really easy to read, and uh, on any kind of device, like nobody is having issues. How many times have you gone to a site and the type is super small and it's hard to read? It's frustrating for people, and it makes them subconsciously feel like your content's hard. And when it feels hard, they don't want to do it, and they leave and they move on. So a good way to think about it is whatever you set your body copy at, your headlines double that size. We're looking again at contrast a big contrast between headline and body copy. 
So a lot of times the simple formula when I'm working on a client side, whatever my body copies at, I double it for my H1 and then I split the difference with my H2. So 16 for body, 32 for an H1, 24 for an H2. That's kind of where I start with my base and depending on the, the typeface that we're using, I may adjust that a little bit. Or like for my own side, we bump that up to 20. But it's for contrast and legibility, this is a really good formula to remember. Also, no light rays. <laughs> no light rays. Uh, product companies love light gray and tiny fonts, tiny typefaces. Uh, a lot of themes that you're going to come across have light gray type because designers and developers are designing them and they want them to look super pretty and they make the type light gray because it makes their pictures look all amazing and then you suffer when you buy that theme. So one of the very first things that we tell clients, uh, where we tell friends that they're buying an off-the-shelf feed, the very first thing to do is go in, look at the color of your type, and if it is not black, or it's not all twos, or it's not at least all threes, change it, right? We don't, light gray type is really, really difficult to read. Uh, especially if you look at an aging generation on who your, who your market is, the older that you get, the more difficult it is to read online. The more difficult it is to read on screens, and that light gray type starts looking really, really difficult. So go with black, or a super dark color, or go with a really, really, if you're gonna go not with a full black, but a, a gray, go with uh, all twos, all threes, stay as close to, go as close to the hex code as black as possible. Black's all zeros. So the farther you get away from zero, the lighter gray you get. I also wanna talk about alignment. Because this is another one that's easy to fix, but a lot of people mess up, right? Pick one axis and all the things are going to align to that axis. So ideally, you don't want some things aligned left, some things aligned right, some things aligned in the center, unless it's high contrast and it's done on purpose. But you pick one axis and align all the things to that axis. So this one, we're looking at left alignment. Everything's over on the left. If you're going to align them on the top, you want to make sure everything lines up on the top. This is especially true when you're looking at, if you have a sidebar. I hate sidebars, so I don't use them a lot. But if you have a sidebar on your site, the top of your content and your sidebar need to line up. When you buy a theme, most of the time that's going to happen out of the box because the designer designed it that way or the developer created it that way. But the minute you change to a different Google font or you change to a different font off type kit, not every font has the same line height. Some of them are going to move down a little bit. Some of them are going to move up a little bit. Some are going to, even at, if you take 20 fonts all at the same height, height the same size, they're all going to be different sizes. So that's going to be something you may have to adjust if you change the font on the theme that you purchase. Also looking at aligning to one axis, this is my personal blog app, family blog, uh, where we blog about vacations, but the bottom, you align to the baseline, or you can align to the center. Another place that we see sites where you notice something's funky, but you're not quite sure, is the header, is that navigation. When you plug your logo into a theme, you need to make sure that it's lining up correctly with the navigation, either to the baseline or across the center. So that's an easy place to make a little adjustment that's gonna make your design look more professional and more polished than if you just pop your logo in and ignore the alignment. Content, body content should always be aligned left. All the way down the left. We call it in the design world, align left, rag right. Or flush. Yes. When you hear rag right or anything, it's the, the right side is the one that's uneven. So when we talk about it, we say, Line left, rag right, never justify your text. When clients come back to us and they look at the design concept and we mock it up and we send it and they're like, can you justify that please? No, no we can't. <laughs> Let's have a conversation about why that is a bad choice. Let's have a conversation about why the justifying text is a bad choice. So there are things, if you look at the top and the bottom of these little lines that go through, when you justify text, it spaces them all out funky and it makes things called rivers, which are gaps through all the lines of your type and it makes it super hard to read. Or in this box here, it squishes all the type together super, super tight. 
and there's not enough space in there. All your words are starting to run together, which makes it really hard to read. And then in the bottom, they're like, sorry, that was weird. We squeezed these together, but we've got to space all those out. Now there's these big old giant gaps between your words. Justifying text is super hideously ugly. Don't ever <laughs> and don't align center. If you're going to align something to the center, make it a headline, a subheadline, a short block quote. It's got to be something short that's easy to digest really quickly. If it's a paragraph of type, if it's body <coughs> copy, you don't want to align center because this is what happens to your eyeballs. They're like, ah, 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 as you're reading, and it makes some, you might not notice it, but subconsciously it feels like you're having to work harder to read that content. We also say the same thing for the reason of don't indent your type. My daughter has to do this when she writes for school, and I'm like, ew. <laughs> no indenting for the same reason because it makes that eye jump all funky every time they get the eyes going and it's making all this weird subconscious stuff go on it's just you want your type to be as easy as possible to read because when it's easy they're going to read more they're going to stay longer they're going to scroll more they're going to click more they're going to consume more which ultimately means a higher conversion rate for you on your site so I also want to talk about color it's really hard for people to pick good colors. There are a lot of color palette generators out there. You can pick color palettes. Um, but more important than actually picking your colors is not picking too many colors. So what I want to talk about is sticking to two to three core brand colors. So for every site that we design and work on, you stick. I try mostly to stick to two primary colors for the brand. I love color, so for my own personal projects, I go with three. Um, but I have control, so I feel good about that. Um, <laughs> so Born Free is my agency, Inspired and Productions, my family and adventure blog, and profitable project plans, of course, that um, I teach on client management for designers. Which is awesome. Thanks. <laughs> uh, for each one of these, for each brand, so I look at three, two or three main brand colors. And those are the only colors that we use in the design of that theme, in the design of that site. And then I add one action color. So two to three brand colors and one action color. That one action color is only ever used for things that are going to trigger the, the visitor to do something, for a link, for a button, for a call to action. Because what I want to start doing is training people that come to the site. Every time you see that color, it means you need to do something. Every time you see that color, click on it. Every time you see that color, stick your email in that box and give it to me. Right? Like, every time you see that color, it's an action to do something. So if we look at some examples, jenniferborn.com uh, is where Profitable Project Plan lives. So that site is all navy blue and lime green in the teal. But pink is my action color. So you will only ever see pink on that site in a call to action. So in a content upgrade, on a blog post, or in a button, or something like that. So on that site, we're training people, when you see pink, take action. The same thing's true with, with uh, BoardCreative.com. So we look at the whole site, the brand colors are black and red. The whole site is black and red with a little bit of tan because it's a warmer feeling than gray and everybody uses gray. Uh, and the blue is the action color. So on that site, the only way you're seeing blue is the links and the buttons. <coughs> yes? Yeah. Is there a rule of thumb for what to select for the action color? Contrast. So the, rule, the question was, is there, is there a rule of thumb for selecting the action color? There are all kinds of studies that have come out about what color your buttons should be. And people are like, your buttons should be green, because green means go. Don't use red buttons, because that's bad, and it means stop. That's such crap. Because <laughs> you know what all the studies after that show? It doesn't matter what the hell color your button is. All that matters is it's a totally different color than everything that's around it. What matters is that there's contrast. So your button can be, I wouldn't choose yellow, because like, it's hard to read and it's hard to see. 
But other than that, I would say no yellow. But it doesn't matter what color your button is as long as that button color was the only place you're going to see that, right? It's all about contrast. So again, inspired imperfection, same thing. So the brand colors are the teal and the purple, or the blue and the purple. I use a little bit of green here and there, but again, pink is that action color there. Buttons, links, calls to action. Uh, I use pink as block quotes on that site as well because I use them infrequently and I want to call action, call attention to that. But you want the best design that, that you can possibly have is the design that people don't notice. You want them to notice your content. You want them to connect with your images and read your content. And the design should support all of that, not stand out. So by keeping your colors to a minimum, using your two or three core brand colors and that one action color, not going all crazy, you're keeping the focus on the content itself. Now images are another place that we see people make some not so great choices. There are so many stock image sites out there. You can get images from anywhere, but don't get them off Google Images. <laughs> the, one of the first things that's super easy to fix and you can do with absolutely you know, little effort is just making sure that whenever you use images, you're using big, large, full width images. Not only is this better for social sharing, Right? Have you ever shared a blog post over to Facebook or something and you get like, it's a little tiny square with your content next to it and you're like, how come mine's all little? Like, how come I just have this little square and like they share it and it's a big little pretty image? It's because the image in your blog post isn't big enough. So a good rule of thumb is your full width images on your blog need to be at least 600 pixels wide. That's usually if it's at least 600 pixels wide it's going to show up as a big, beautiful image on social media. So what we tell clients is always go with a big, full-width image. Let's look at these examples. Full-width images look beautiful on all device sizes. Right and left aligned images don't. Here's why. A nice full-width image still stretches side to side. Right or left aligned images, especially if they're small, leave weird white gaps on the sides of pictures. And then your text wraps around it all funky. Look at that one at, on, on the left. There's like this weird white gap and there's a sad little line of text at the top. That's so ugly. Look, look at the one on the right. There's like one tiny little word, in. All oh, sad and alone. Because the text wrapping is so terrible. <laughs> so most people, if you're going to right or left align images on your site, you see the minute it's not desktop anymore, center that crap. Like center it immediately, because then you don't have to worry about that. But, or make them big enough that on those device sizes you're not going to, the most common device sizes you're not going to have those issues. But most clients, they don't want to spend a whole bunch of time trying to get their image just right so if they left the line it on the devices they most use, they're not gonna have that with, that is so much work for them. So we say, go with the full width image. Not only does it look better, it provides a better experience and it shares better across social media. Also avoid the super cheesy, awful stock images because that's the fastest way to look like an amateur is to use crappy stock images. So we're gonna look at some bad <laughs> options and we're gonna look at some better options. So you can learn how to fix some really great images. Because one of the things I hear from a lot of people all the time is, where do you get your stock photos? I'm like, the same place as you do. I just know how to pick them better. <laughs> <laughs> so, cheesy, awful, smiling, pointy, awkwardly posed. <laughs> Obvious, if you're writing a blog post about creating a vision for your brand, and you're like, let me go look. Here's a plot. Here's it says vision. We don't need to be that obvious. People aren't that stupid, right? So we can look at instead of using a cheesy smiling post picture of somebody, look at something in action. I look for no faces when I do stock, stock photos. I'm like, when they're like the, the words to exclude, happy smiling face. I, all the things that people normally look for, I'm like, exclude all that. Yeah. I don't want happy, I don't want smiling, I don't want faces. I'm like, give me the back of your head. 
Give me action. Give me some. Give me something else. So you want to look for. I look for hands, right? So if I'm looking for something, I'll put in hands in the search bar. Hands and what I'm looking for. Show me somebody doing something. Show me something in action. Or in the bottom, instead of being super obvious and looking for, you know, something that says what you're doing. Like the worst is when we have coaching clients and they are like, I found this image I want to use on my page all about my coaching services. And it's like the Scrabble words that say coaching. No. For like, <laughs> <laughs> so don't talk about why that's a bad idea. <laughs> Same thing. The words, we avoid words. No happy, no smiling, no words. If you're going to talk about strategy, Let's talk about concepts that have to do with strategy. What other things in life? You have to be good at strategy if you play chess. So go with chess. You know, if you're looking at searching, what do people use to search? Or what do you, people use to search? Binoculars, telescopes, magnifying glasses. Look for things that communicate concept, but aren't obvious. My favorite is like, we wrote a blog post about bad clients, and I'm like, bad, and I'm like, crap, I can't use picture poo. Like, toxic, toxic gas masks, gas masks. So you want to look for things that aren't obvious, but communicate the same kind of concept. So the same thing, and then we look at, if you, clip art, no. Just don't do that. If it's like clip art, whatever, just say no. If it's cut out of a white background, they call that isolated, just say no. In the search bar of what to exclude, say isolated. Don't use those. Uh, because you're writing a blog post about time, not cute. The other one, that's a beautiful image. Somebody looking at their watch, right? We're looking for hands, we're looking for action, we're looking for concepts, we're looking for the non-obvious. Right, those are going to be the things that grab people's attention and get them to be more interested in your content or click over from social media or pause that scroll a little bit to see what your post is all about. And again, we avoid the happy smiling faces looking right at the camera and we go for somebody who's looking away, right? engaged in action, in doing something like that. Just making a good image selection can make all the difference in the appearance and the professionalism of your site. So I'm not going to tell you that I always was good at this. Because when I had my first website, I totally used cut out images like that on the top. I thought, they're floating. It's so cool. It's not a square. How many clients are like, can I use images that aren't in a box? Oh my god. I feel for you because I was there. I totally did that. And then I realized, this doesn't look very good. And I had to go back and change it. So if you have images like this, or you've chosen images like this on your site, the most awesome thing is, you can always go back and you can update them. And you can change them. In 2014, we overhauled the entire Born Creative brand. It used to be like rainbows, because again, I like color and rainbows. And then my, my husband had joined my business full time, and he became my boss, was telling me what to do. He's like, we gotta man this brand up. <laughs> I got rid of the sidebar and my content width got bigger and I'm like, you can make images smaller, but you can't make them bigger. So I had to go back and replace every every blog post image that I'd ever created, which was a blessing and a curse because it was a lot of work, but my site looks way better now. Um, what we tell clients, because a lot of clients are like, I'm not going back, why not 300 blog posts? I'm not going back and making bigger pictures. Are you crazy? And we tell them from here moving forward, go with the big full width images. Going back, if you're caught up and you're like, I really want to work on my site. Or you have a virtual assistant that you work with and at the end of the month they're like, I have a couple extra hours, what do you want me to do? You're like, go back to those old blog posts and start replacing some images. And just do a little bit of time. But start with your most current and work your way backwards. Right? So you don't have to worry about all of a sudden going back and redoing everything you know, right away. But you want to start working on those things, especially if you use a plugin. Uh, I use a plugin called Revive Old Posts. Revival Post has a total crap UI. It's terrible to use. But the functionality of it is awesome. Because if you have a lot of blog posts, you can go in and you can configure it to share by category or by tag. You can exclude stuff. What it does is it goes in and it automatically reshares all your old blog posts. 
to whatever time configure. You can say every four hours, or every five hours, or every three hours. And you can choose different time configurations for Facebook and Twitter, because on Twitter you would want to share more than on Facebook. That plugin is awesome. It reshares and keeps, keeps traffic coming to my site for posts I wrote three years ago that are still relevant. I exclude anything about events and anything that is time sensitive, but it keeps traffic coming to my site all the time. Right? Yep, thank you. Uh, so because I have all of that going on and I am constantly promoting old posts, it was important for us to go back and update the images on all those posts as well. Uh, so images make a huge difference. If you've got a lot of posts already and you need to go back, just do a little bit of time. Do it while you're watching Netflix at night. Brian's like, what are you doing on your computer? I'm like, I'll turn the brightness down. I'll turn the screen this way. And I'll kind of do little tweets while I'm watching Netflix at night or something like that. But the other thing you want to do when you're looking for images is to look for images that are going to give visual cues or going to direct attention in a specific way. Um, you used to see this tons with arrows. Those off. Uh, leaned against the light switch. Uh, you used to see uh, this with all the arrows. People would have red blinking arrows pointing at all the things, and then responsive design all blew up, and then people were like, crap, my arrows are pointing at nothing. <laughs> my arrow in my video, or my arrow in my call to action, my, it's stacked, and now my arrow is pointing to nothing, and I don't know what to do with me. I have to get rid of all the arrows. So, when you're looking at images, let's say you have content on a page and you have a call to action in your sidebar, one of the easiest ways that you can use a visual cue to direct information is to put an image in there with a person looking at your call to action. People's faces pointing in a direction are shown by all kinds of heat map studies that when the picture is looking in a certain direction, the person looking at the site, they're gonna look in the same direction. So this person is like, check out my opt-in, baby. You don't know why you're going to look at that, but you're totally going to look at it because subconsciously, I am directing your eyeballs right to that call to action. So you want to use those for visual cues. And it's okay to still use arrows, but let's make them just go down. Right? The call to action below. Because no matter what device size they're on, it's always going to be below. Right? You don't ever want to point an, image, an arrow to the left or the right because it's not going to be that way on the phone. So let's talk a little more about content. We're going to talk about breaking up the text. Hard to read, easy to read. Hard to read, easy to read. Hard to read, easy to read. 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 Subheadlines, contrast between those subheadlines, bulleted lists. Strategic bolding. Notice they say strategic bolding. Do you ever have those clients who are like, bold like every third word on every line, and you're like, dude, if everything's important, nothing is important. <laughs> so strategic bolding here and there to grab some attention. But taking the time to format your content well. Small paragraphs, subheadlines, bulleted lists. This is going to make your content feel easier to read, lighter. It's going to encourage more reading. Also, bringing in color, right? Not a lot of color, two to three brand colors. But pop in color 